Joining me now to talk more about this case is Ian Milheiser. He's a senior correspondent at Vox and wrote the article I quoted throughout that introduction. Ian is also the author of The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. Ian, I got to ask, the title of your book is so darn prescient. I don't know if you ever knew what you were writing about was going to be so compelling. Let's, you know, you note in your article, Ian, this decision is riddled with legal errors, some of them obvious enough to be spotted by a first year law student. What are the most egregious errors that stood out to you? Oh, man, where to begin with mm. this? So, like, First of all, there's a rule that you're not allowed to be in federal court unless you have been injured in some way by the person you're suing. So for a father to sue the federal government to challenge Title 10, they'd have to be alleged that Title 10 has done anything at all to them. And in this case, like he doesn't allege that he's ever used Title 10 programs. He doesn't allege that his daughters have ever done it. He doesn't allege that his daughters plan to use Title 10 programs. So he, he just the court doesn't have jurisdiction. This man shouldn't be there in the first place. You know, setting that aside, I mean, substantively, I think the most concerning thing about Katzmerich's decision is that there are a line of Supreme Court's decisions stretching back to the 1920s, saying that there's a right to have some control over the upbringing of your own children. But there's also a line of decisions saying that individuals have a right to contraception. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so this issue of like whether the right to parent trumps the right to contraception has been through up in front of many courts going back to at least the 1980s. And what the courts have consistently said is, no, one right doesn't trump the other. You have to read these two rights in harmony. Um, specifically, what a lot of courts have said is that so long as a government program is not coercive. So, you know, if the government had tried to force this man's daughters to take contraceptive pills, that would be a problem. But that is not what happened here. What happened here is that the government is funding health programs. Some of these health programs provide family planning care to all patients, including some patients who are under the age of 18. And there's no coercion there. Like, if, if you want to get the, the medical care, you can get it. If you don't, you don't. So, like, this is you know, there are so many problems with this opinion, I don't know where to start, but it's not something that I find that surprising, given what we know about Katzmerich's record. You know, Ian, we have to talk about the Supreme Court's decision in the Griswold versus Connecticut case and how that plays into this recent Becerra decision. Back in 1965, the Supreme Court invalidated a law in Connecticut that made it illegal for married couples to use any sort of contraception. The court inferred a right to privacy and that it existed within the United States Constitution. How precarious is a Griswold's future with this court? So the short answer is with this court, I think that Griswold and then subsequent decisions saying that the decision applies to unmarried couples is probably safe. And, and the reason why is in the Dobbs opinion, uh, Justice Kavanaugh wrote a separate opinion where he said, look, I, I'm just going after abortion here. I, I, I don't want to go after contraception. So if Kavanaugh means what he says, and there's no reason for him to have said it unless he meant it. That means right now there are probably five votes on the Supreme Court to protect the right to contraception. But members leave the court. You know, justices die. Justices retire. And if a Republican wins the presidential election in 2024, I think that Republican is likely to replace any justice who retires with people more like Sam Alito, the author of the Dobbs decision. And, you know, I don't know if there are, you know, there are probably somewhere between two and four votes on the current Supreme Court to eliminate the right to contraception. And, you know, if Republican presidents start replacing justices, we're going to find out very quickly what, you know, whether that number is closer to four, and if they add a seat, there, there could potentially be five. This judge, Judge Kazmarek, wields a lot of power, as we know. He's a federal district court judge. Just as a reminder to our viewers, that's a lifetime appointment, even on the district court level. You also wrote in your piece about the procedural rules that frequently enable federal plaintiffs in Texas to choose which judge will hear their case. 95% of civil cases filed in Amarillo, Texas's federal courthouse are automatically assigned to him, him being Judge Kazmarek. 
So litigants who want their case to be decided by a judge with a history as a Christian rights activist with a demonstrated penchant for interpreting the law flexibly to benefit his ideological allies can all but ensure that outcome by bringing their lawsuit in Amarillo. I mean, Ian, that's disturbing to say the least, but it's legal. So is this same strategy playing out in other district courts across the country thanks to stacked benches with Trump's conservative judicial appointments? So the answer is the local rules governing case assignments vary from court to court. So federal trial courts, they're called district courts. The way that they're supposed to work is you file a lawsuit in a federal district court, and then that case is assigned at random to one of the judges um, you know, somewhere within that court. And that randomness is just a rule of fairness. It's to prevent plaintiffs from picking a judge that they know is likely to rule in their favor and then getting the order they want from you know, what may be a very biased judge. In Texas, for reasons that don't make a lot of sense to me, so, you know, if you file it in Amarillo, Texas, you get a 95 percent chance of drawing Matthew Ketz Merrick. If you file it in Olympia, Texas, you have a 100 percent chance of drawing Drew Tipton, who, if anything, is worse than Ketz Merrick. Um, you know, these are extraordinarily right wing Trump judges with a history of handing down really dubious decisions that cannot be squared with what the law actually says. And so we have seen this pipeline. I mean, in Katzmerich's case, he struck down, he ordered Biden to reinstate much of Trump's border policy, a policy called remain in Mexico. That case went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, no, Katzmerich, you were wrong. And then Katzmerich just issued a decision yesterday saying, nope, I'm going to order Biden to reinstate the remain in Mexico program again. He handed down this birth control decision. You know, he has a decision, a case pending for him right now that seeks to declare Mifi Pristone, the abortion pill, illegal. So that Medicaid, so that medication abortions, which amount for something to like something like 53 percent of abortions in the United States, potentially could become unlawful once Katzmerich gets his hands on this. So, what has happened here is that right wing litigants know all they got to do is drive to Amarillo, Texas. They'll get this judge who will rubber stamp whatever outcome they want, and you know maybe it gets reversed 11 months later right. by the That's Supreme right. Court. But in the meantime, Katz Merrick's order is in place and people lose their rights. You know, Ian, we saw it also happen with the Aileen Cannon forum shopping that happened in Fort Pierce with the lawsuit civilly that was brought by Donald Trump that eventually the 11th Circuit got rid of. But how long and how much time and money was wasted? Ian Milheiser, um, I said to somebody the other day, whoever thought we'd be sitting here talking about Supreme Court as much as we do? But you are a friend of the show, and we always appreciate you taking the time to explain these things to us. We'll keep an eye out on this docket, as we always do. But thanks for being here, and happy holidays. All right. Thank you, Katie. Happy holidays to you as well. Thank you.